Welcome to the car guys and this week the natural successor to the nine cars I should never have bought episode and one that actually you suggested. That's right, it's the five cars I should never have sold. Which means we're wallowing in regret, self-pity and downright stupidity. Mark my words folks, there are some colossal automotive blunders coming your way and I hope you can at least take some comfort in the fact that even I get it wrong sometimes. And if you're a regular subscriber or follower to the channel, then I reckon you can guess at least one of them. So let's go back in time, plunder the Car Guys archives. It's time for me to eat some humble pie. Before we get straight into this week's episode, a quick thank you to all of you who have subscribed to the channel so far. We really appreciate the fact that you're supporting us with a simple click of the subscribe button. And whilst it doesn't cost anything for weekly Car Guys episodes, the growth of subscriptions is something that we can use to gauge the success of the channel and boost our morale. If you haven't already, please subscribe. It really means a lot and it allows us to create even more content in the future. Here we are then, the five cars that I should never have sold and of course there are a few vehicles here that you may not expect and a surprising bias towards one particular brand. Why do you sell anything at all Damien I hear you ask? Well it's a good point because let's face it if you don't ever sell anything then you can't actually regret anything. But even for me there are limits to how many cars I can store, how many I can maintain and look after and also how many I can afford. But I have to admit Looking at some of the cars on this list, even I start to feel a little bit sick. But since it's humiliation time for Damien, on with the show. And the first one this week is this, the Porsche 911 993 Carrera. This is the two wheel drive basic 993, but it's the sweetest handling, I think, of the whole range. It's midnight blue, it's got marble grey interior, and it was my first ever 911. So it has a very special place in my heart. And like my 355 Spider, which is my first ever Ferrari, and I still own over there, I probably should have kept my first Porsche as well. This was the perfect driving car. It really taught me a lot about vehicle dynamics and handling. It taught me how to handle an older 911. And of course, it was such a big step up from the MR2 sports car that I had previously that it also taught me about engineering integrity, the beauty of the build quality and reliability of the Porsche brand. It got me excited about Porsche for the very first time. So you could say it started my love affair with that brand. My car's registration was November 126, Charlie Oscar Victor. And before you ask, yes, I have looked for it and I can't find it anywhere. So it's either been scrapped or it's on a different registration plate. But either way, it's probably gone now. I bought this car from Dick Lovett in the center of Bristol on a very cold December day. December, a good time to buy cars, of course, because not many people do. And so those dealerships really want to hit their end of year targets. My car was a Varia Ram model, so just a little bit faster, probably the one to buy. In terms of 911s, it really was the perfect first one to have. I still think of it often, and I have to say, this is one that I should never have sold. Next on the list is the Porsche 911 996 GT3, and this is the Gen 2 model not the Gen 1. I've never really been that fussed about the Gen 1. For me, it's all about the Gen 2 one, which is the one that Jeremy Clarkson tested against the Challenge Stradale. I love the prominence and stance of the thing. I love that rear wing. And for me, this was the first GT3 that I ever bought brand new. Because of course, back then, you could do that. You could walk into a Porsche dealer and say, I've heard about this new GT3. Could I have one, please? They would put my name down, take a deposit, and you would actually get one. There was none of this allocation nonsense that you get these days, and you didn't have to buy 15 other Porsches to get it. You could actually put your name down as an enthusiast and actually get one. And this was mine, a basalt black 
beautiful example, had a bit of carbon fiber in it, but it looked mean, it looked really low, and that engine, that incredible engine, which just revved and revved and revved and sounded sweet as a nut. I mean, it is not often that I think of previous cars that I used to have, but I have to say the 996 GT3 does come up quite a lot. I even saw at Paul Stevens once, a 8,000 mile example, which looked almost identical to mine. And I was so close to buying it. And I really should have done because it was the perfect price and it was also the perfect spec. I should have got one. It cost 86,000 pounds new with just a small number of options on it. And really, yeah, this one took me into the stratosphere. The 993, 911 was good, but compared to this, I mean, this felt like a starship. If I still owned this car, I would be the only owner, one owner, 996 GT3. What an incredible story that would be. I still remember how rough the engine sounded when you first started it up and just left it to idle. Honestly, it just sounded like you just poured a load of ironmongery into a washing machine on the spin cycle. But once it started revving, once it really got on song, wow, what an engine, what a noise. Yes, the handling was pretty tricky, especially in the wet, but I have such a soft spot for this car and should I have sold it? No, I should not. Next up, a bit of a surprise, I think you'll admit, and it is the Audi RS6. Now, this was the first estate car that I'd ever owned. And of course, anyone who knows, knows that this is one of the uber super estates that you can buy the RS6 Avant. It was in the right color. It had all the options you could ever wish for. It was absolutely fully loaded. It used to be a demonstrator. So it had great amounts of carbon, tons of tech, but of course it's super fast. It's four wheel drive. It can cope with any weather conditions. It's got an enormous boot so you can chuck anything into it. So in terms of a practical car for the car guy's garage, it was fantastic. It also sounded fantastic, it was practical, it was safe. It's just the perfect all-rounder. And I even picked it up for a great price as well. But for some reason, I let it slip through my fingers. I was caught at a weak moment and decided to sell. And really, I probably should have kept it for a bit longer. I mean, it was incredible. You'll have seen it on the channel. You'll have seen Jason take it down to Portugal as well. That was the main reason why I bought it. It was part of a challenge between that and the VW Phaeton. The Phaeton, incidentally, I also loved, but I was a little bit more eager to get rid of that than the RS6. But yeah, but probably I think this one should never have sold it. Did I look like a complete hooligan whilst I was driving it? Yes, of course. But sometimes you need a bit of hooligan in your life. And standing next to a car that I will never sell, let me tell you about one that I did and probably shouldn't. This is another Porsche, and it is the Porsche 997 Turbo S. Now, this car I absolutely adored. It was in GT Silver, which, remember, is that silvery blue that the Carrera GT launch car came in. It had all the right extras. It was super classy. It was ridiculously fast, four wheel drive, all the toys, quite subtle, which obviously I liked. And it was also the car that destroyed my sales relationship with Porsche Bournemouth or Chapelgate, as it was known then. The Turbo S was the car I suddenly decided I needed in my life. And wouldn't you know it, Chapelgate Porsche had one. So I was in advanced negotiations on this car. I'd gone through every part of it. I'd test driven it. I'd decided it was the one that I wanted and I was literally on the phone making the final discussions to buy the car. They knew I wanted the car. They knew it was the one that I was definitely going to buy. And then they said they'd already sold it. Right out from under me, they'd already sold this car whilst I was right in there and at the point of actually paying the money for it, they gave it to someone else. And that is unforgivable in my book. If you're gonna build a relationship with someone, you do not stiff them and stab them in the back like that. So from that moment on, I would never buy another new Porsche or used 
from Portia Bournemouth again. It all stemmed from there. Has there been any attempts to reconcile? Of course not. It's Portia. But from my point of view, that really damaged my view of Porsche authorised dealers. I thought they were more honourable than that. Could have been a rogue salesperson. Who knows? But no one really tried to make any amends. So what happened then is I walked obviously away from them straight away, but I found another car almost identical, I think at Castle Motors, and uh, that's the one I bought. I traded in my Aston Martin V8 Vantage, and I got my 997 Turbo S. And I mean, it was just the sweetest car. It was absolutely fantastic. It was featured in Total 911 magazine. Why did I sell it? I, could you, I can't even believe I'm saying this. I sold it because I found it a bit too boring. It was a bit too good at everything. It was so accomplished and perfect that it didn't have any of the little flaws or foibles that sometimes endear you to a car. It was just too good. And that's a real mistake because not only is it obviously incredible, what a car, but now obviously I expect they're going to be quite highly prized in the future. It's the Turbo S, the range topping model, which I always love. <sighs> yeah, I sold it. And you know what? I really shouldn't have done. And here we are then. We're at the end of the five cars that I never should have sold and yes 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 you know what it is you've all been pillaring me ever since it happened and now in front of you and the site and all of this congregation i say absolutely damien you were an idiot to sell your ferrari f40 this was a car of course that i should have kept forever i definitely should have kept until they went up to two million quid. Uh, that's a bit of a mistake, but you have to remember, this is a beautiful, iconic Ferrari in its own right. And if you are a fan of Ferrari, which I think you can tell I am, I should never have sold it. It should be in the Car Guys collection right now. And yes, I am uh, deeply, deeply sorry. You were right, of course you were right. The Car Guys audience are always right. But in a uh, moment of madness, I decided to sell the car. I had driven it a lot. I'd done five, six, seven thousand kilometers, I think, in it. I had a lot of fun. I loved it. I'd maintained it perfectly. It was a perfect example. It had carbon fiber weave all over on all the panels, which tells you that it was an original paint car. It was exhilarating. The whoosh from the turbos, the ridiculous acceleration, the craziness of all of that power in that go-kart-esque type handling vehicle. <sighs> But really it's that shape, it's the shape and what it means. When you tell people that you have a F40, there's a kind of hush in the room where they go, oh, oh, you've, oh, you've got an F40. A friend of mine over there, uh, he's got one. Uh, I'm gonna be driving that for Drive Every Ferrari and I'm sure I'm gonna get quite a lot of pangs of regret when I do that. I still don't really know why I sold it. I mean, I, I just shouldn't have done, I definitely shouldn't have done at that time when they were only worth 750, 800,000 pounds. They're obviously now worth quite a bit more. So to get back into one is gonna be quite costly, but I do feel that at some point there should be an F40 back in the garage. Um, but that's gonna be a bullet biting time because yeah, it's gonna be a big purchase. This is one that I absolutely regret. I should never have sold it. And I do think about it quite a bit. A friend wanted it. I thought it would be a good idea. I thought he would keep it a long time. Uh, yeah, just didn't, didn't turn out like that. So um, my lovely cherished low mileage, low owner F40 sadly went and It's the one I think about the most. It's the one that eats me away. Most of the other cars that I've got rid of over the years, I don't really care that much. But, um, but yeah, this one sort of still hurts. So who knows, watch this space. Maybe I'll get another one at some point in the future. But uh, this is me telling you that you were right, my friends, and I do regret it. As those are five cars I should never 
have sold. And I thought maybe a couple of honorary mentions, the Challenge Stradale, I shouldn't have sold that really, but to be honest, I was relatively happy with that. But also that Porsche 911, the early car, the Super Sport Targa that had the most incredible side profile and was just such a great car to leap in and just go off and drive. You didn't really care about the condition too much. Yeah, that, that I probably should have kept that as well because it was just such a cool, cool thing. Everything else has got a good reason really for me to get rid of it. I'm pretty happy with those decisions. But uh, these five, if you were gonna twist my arm and get me to talk about the ones that I do think of, this was those. So I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you enjoyed my penance. And uh, if you like what we're doing on the Car Guys channel, please subscribe, leave comments and likes. And there'll be another episode next week.